Hello everyone, my name is Carmelo Iñacolo and I'm a doctoral candidate in city planning at MIT DASP and an adjunct faculty of digital techniques for urban design at Columbia University in New York City at the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. First of all, I'd like to thank Professor Paolo Ceccarelli and Elaud for the opportunity of sharing some thoughts and reflection with you today, more specifically on urban design and digital technologies. These areas of investigations with their methods and tools are at the core of my research interest at MIT. In fact, my academic research focuses on urban morphology and environmental psychology, with a geographic focus on historic city across the Mediterranean basin. More specifically, from a methodological standpoint, I'm interested in employing urban analytics and spatial statistics to investigate the complexity of our data-rich environment, and eventually to envision new design solutions at the different scales of the built environment. In this short interview, I'm going to focus on the scopes of urban design, its responsibilities, and challenges. In order to do so, I will briefly chronicle how the so-called urban design discipline came to life, and I will link this reflection to the well-known Michael Sorkin's piece titled The Ends of Urban Design. In general, we could easily say that while urban settlements have been providing humans with the spaces for social and economic interactions for millennia, urban design as a discipline is still considered a relatively new one. As Alex Krieger wrote in his Where and How Does Urban Design Happen, the art of shaping the physical form of cities has been mostly carried under the ages of kings, for example, Spain's Philip II, popes, Sixtus V, prefects, houseman, social theorists, Ebenezer Howard, architects, Le Corbusier, landscape architects, Olmsted, and infrastructure managers such as Robert Moses. However, if in the past a formal definition of urban design had not been fully conceptualized, the ruins left by World War II demanded architecture schools to institutionalize a bridge between urban planning and architecture. In 1956, Joseph Louis Sert from Harvard GSD organized an urban design conference, which eventually turned into a programmal act for the establishment of the world's first urban design graduate program. Sert's concern that the act of shaping cities had become preoccupied with economic, social, policy, and other non-physical issues motivated the urgency to educate a new generation of urban-minded practitioners of the built environment. The forces at which the newly established urban discipline was to be directed were respectively the Beaux-Arts movement and the functionalist urbanism. While the first one was mainly concerned about the nostalgic forms of expression and aestheticism, the second one had emphasized the scientific component of city planning and denied its imaginative capacities. By operating in this spectrum, Sert situated the notion of urban design, quote, as the most creative phase of city planning, in which imagination and artistic capacity can play an important part, end of quote. However, his view had one significant limitation. The formalism of this new discipline inevitably inherited from the built environment trivium of architecture, landscape, and planning. Essentially, what we can say is that Sert's urban design was not civic yet. In 1961, Jane Jacobs published The Dead and Life of Great American Cities, still anonymously considered among the most influential critiques of functionalist urbanism. And in 1960, Kevin Lynch, with the image of the city, argued for moving beyond formal build types, while advancing an ecological and psychological reading of urban spaces. These seminal works revealed how urban form is never innocent of social content. It has a civic component made of people and perceptions. The importance of acknowledging the social fabric of urban spaces, such as streets, sidewalks, landmarks, turn these spaces into civic places. In line with these ideas, the research conducted by Ollie White and Jan Gell has helped designers to analyze how people use public spaces and how street furniture, design materials, and the overall physical configuration of urban spaces 
play an essential role in shaping human behavior interaction. Gell's and White's contribution rejected a modernistic and utilitarian interpretation of public spaces in favor of their significance in the community life. Building on the complex relationship between people and spaces and on the political and planning processes that shape it, Jan McCarg in the 70s helped define the needs for today's geographic information systems, also known as GIS. In order to analyze the most appropriate location to build in harmony with the natural landscape, McCarg introduced the notion of layers. Today, GIS and spatial analytics are among the essential tools employed by urbanists to study, and, to study urban and natural systems at the variety of scales. Moreover, they facilitate decision-making processes and can also perform as support to participatory data collection tools and even demonstrate with maps the interaction between development alternatives, social and natural systems. In general, the advent of GIS and the use of more recent advanced computing technologies to address urban issues have triggered a certain level of optimism towards the idea of an efficient and optimized cities since the early 2000s. However, throughout the last decade, scholars have shared their skepticism regarding the deployment of ubiquitous technologies in urban spaces. More specifically, questions on data ownership, surveillance, have raised some doubts about whether technologies are making our urban spaces more democratic than before. Shannon Matern, for example, in an article titled The City is Not a Computer from 2007, argues how city official and tech companies have been intrigued by the idea of optimizing urban messiness and turning the city into, quote, a programmable and subject rational order, end of quote. The political, social, and behavioral consequences of the censor imbued city remain unexplored and yet questionable. Nevertheless, underscored by Google affiliate Sidewalk Lab's abandonment of its Toronto Smart City project, it is urgent to reconsider how planning models bring participation, digital innovation, and build form together. Throughout this brief excursus on the theoretical discussion about urban design, it is utterly apparent how, 60 years after its recognition as a graduate program, there is still a lack of consensus on what this field is about and what its scope should entail. 15 years ago, Michael Serkin even called for the end of urban design. Once, quote, broad and hopeful, now rigid, restrictive and boring, urban design has become a discipline unable to confront the human needs of cities and citizens, especially now that the growth of slums and endlessness of sprawl and alienating effects of disempowerment is taking place in our cities. End of quote. As a result of this debate, it is timely to understand how urban design has come to our current crisis, what theories and analytical methods have been proposed, and how urbanists employ digital instruments to shape spaces while bearing in mind the notion of democracy and the risk of surveillance. In particular, as designers and researchers, we should ask, how does urban form relate to its social component, and how have public spaces such as street, sidewalks and area around landmarks been historically constructed to accommodate people's daily lives? What are the methodologies employed to measure and evaluate city form and urban design? And how have civic technologies with the support of GIS tools changed planners' practice and also promoted the idea of participatory mapping and data collection tools? Through investigating the role of urban design, we will hopefully demonstrate that urban design is not situated at a dead end, as Sorkin provocatively stated in 2006. However, it needs to work across scales, time, and actors to inscribe the ethics and expressions of cultural diversity into the larger structure of the city. If planning ideals and manifestos have been hugely influential to the social and economic life of cities, it is now particularly timely to explore the role of digital technologies in measuring, designing, and modeling the built environment of our spaces. I strongly believe that this exploration could lead to groundbreaking normative arguments 
on how the civic spaces of our cities should be designed and how they could thrive as physical anchors of democratic rights. Thank you.